Okay, so today is the day that I start and embark on my 20K project. This is a project to put 20,000 watt hours of lithium capacity into our Echo number one. It's gonna be kind of a big undertaking. There are a lot of different parts to it. So I thought it would be a good idea here at the beginning to kind of take this opportunity and lay out a roadmap sort of of where we're gonna go so you all have an idea of what's gonna be coming in the videos to follow. So this often surprises people who know me or, or have seen me in videos that I don't usually work with a plan. Um, and there are reasons for that is one, I'm usually doing one-offs and you know, if I were doing something multiple times, I would, I would write out a plan. I don't have a written plan, I have a plan in my head, but I don't write much down. Usually something about like this is all the planning that I get into a project and that people would expect me to be very meticulous and I am, but I just don't write it down. So when it came time to do this, I've got a lot of stuff in my head, but I don't have very much written down. And so I thought about how to explain it to you folks. And I thought, well, I could do what I've seen other people do and they make a lot of really cute diagrams and things pop. And then that just seemed like a lot of work, honestly, to make pretty diagrams and plans that I wasn't even gonna use just for the purpose of explaining it. Then I thought, well, wait a minute, instead of a diagram that shows this component here and this wire and then this component here, I've got the components and the wires, so why don't I just set them out as they're going to be and we're going to talk through them. So that's what we're going to do here. So we're going to cover kind of a lot in this, in this video So because there are a lot of different components, but I can break it down into major chunks. So the first one we're going to go over is the 120 volt side of the system. I'll show you what I've got planned for that and the components I'm using and explain why. Then we're going to go into the 12 volt side of things. I'll show you what I've got ready for that and explain why I'm going to do it. I'm going to touch on solar. Not necessarily a part of the 20K project, except that it's going to be another input. And since I'm going to have everything torn apart, I might as well work some of that stuff in now. So we'll talk a little bit, not in super detail about solar. And I'll show you that. And then finally, I'm going to show you the mechanical stuff because I'm going to have to add tables and build seats and move things from compartment to compartment, cut holes, that kind of thing. So I'm going to show you what I'm planning in that. So those are the four basic areas we're going to talk about. And we're going to kick things off over at the uh, assembly table with the 120 volt side next. All right, so here we are, and these are all the components that are going to go into the 120 volt side of things. Now this is, you know, regular household current. So, you know, the, the high voltage plugs that you've got. So I'm gonna start sort of at the shore power connection and work my way inward. Um, so that's, let's start there. So first, I'm gonna replace the shore power connection with this, it's a smart plug. And the reasons why, I've actually done an evaluation on the smart plug in the past. We did some tests, I was able to get some infrared pictures, and it's just a better shore power connection. A little more expensive, but it's a better one. So, smart plug going in in place of the shore power connection that's there. The other benefit of this thing, you ever have a shore power connection, you got that little locking collar and you're like, eh, no, that's not right, eh, no, that's not, oh, it's cross-threaded, eh, no, eh, eh. oh, I finally got it. It could be like a family guy thing, anyway. You don't have to do that with this. It plugs and clicks and it's locked in place. So that's first. Next, from the smart plug, we're gonna go into a circuit breaker. Now, as the Echo ships from Winnebago, and most coaches are this way actually, um, there is not a circuit breaker in between the shore power connection and the inverter that's there. Now, normally that's not a problem because you know, you've got a 30 amp breaker on the pedestal and you've got a 30 amp breaker on your main panel. So, you know, one of those is gonna trip before you, you hit the, the inverter. But how many of you have ever used something like this? This is a 50 to 30 amp conversion plug. And with this, it'll only hook up one leg of the power, so you're safe on volts. But what you're maybe not safe on is amperage. Um, with this, the breaker on the pedestal will feed 50 amps through to your inverter. And now on this inverter that I've got, and we'll get to this later, but it does have a 50 amp transfer capability. So it might not hurt the inverter, but it might hurt the wiring that's between this and the inverter. And it might hurt, you know, the 
anything I install in that wiring. So I thought it would be a good idea to install a circuit breaker. So here I have a little standalone circuit breaker. It's 32 amps and it should protect anything I've got downstream. Okay, so circuit breaker. Now I do have some 10 gauge wiring. This is a two conductor with a ground wiring. These are tinned wires. So I guess I could use it in a marine environment if I wanted to, um, that I'll be using where I need to, where I can't reuse existing wiring. I've got, I've got some more I can use. Next in line, well, I said there was not a circuit breaker between the uh, shore power plug and the inverter, and that's true. However, Winnebago does install an automatic transfer switch. Um, most people know of these from when they use a generator. It will automatically switch between a generator and shore power to provide power to your rig. That's great, but we don't have a generator. So why is it there? Well, Winnebago put it there because they want to protect you against, say, a miswired pedestal if you've got, you know, the hot and neutral reversed or something like that. The automatic transfer switch won't let that power through to the rig. So that's why it's there. I can do a little bit better than that. So I'm going to be installing a Progressive Industries 30 amp hardwired surge suppressor. So in addition to that miswired pedestal protection, the, you know, whatever, we've also got now surge protection. So if you get hit by lightning or something like that, it will go in place kind of right where the automatic transfer switch was, at least logically. I don't know if I'm going to physically mount it in the same place, but logically it's in between the plug and the inverter. So there we go. Surge protector. Again, I've got more 30 amp wiring because up to here, we're only 30 amps, right? Then we get to the big boy, the inverter. This is a Victron Multi Plus 2 3000 watt inverter. Now this inverter is, it's inverter charger, I should be correct about that, is considerably heavier than the one that I'll be removing, the Xantrex 2000 watt. Um, this is, I guess, what they call a low frequency inverter and the Xantrex is a high frequency inverter. What does that mean in layman's terms? Well, so when I was like a sound guy, I would buy amps and some of the amps would be like, you know, 70 pounds and they would have these giant magnets and wire coils in there and that sort of thing. And they were rock solid. You could kick them, throw dirt on them, whatever. And they would just keep working. You couldn't kill them. Then I also got some amps that were switching amps, like a high frequency amp and that they were considerably lighter, so a lot easier to lug around, but they were a little bit more complex on, on the electrical side. And I had a couple of those go bad. That's kind of the same. I'm not suggesting that the Xantrex is going to go bad or anything like that, but that's kind of the difference between a high frequency and a low frequency inverter. Low frequency inverter, lots of iron, think of it that way. Um, and high frequency inverter, more, more high tech. Now the low frequency inverters do have and a low frequency inverter, by the way, is what we had in Lance. The low frequency inverters do have a little bit better of a surge rating than a high frequency inverter. This will surge higher and longer than a high frequency inverter will. And that's important for starting air conditioners, that kind of thing. Although we have not had any problem in our Echo starting the air conditioner with the 2000 watt inverter that we have. It's got plenty of whatever to get over the hump and start that inverter or start that air conditioner. So, and then also if you read the specs and I don't know how much this will, this will come into play, but this one has like about a five to 10 degree better rating as far as handling high temperatures. It'll keep working to a higher temperature than the Xantrex is rated to. Now, this also has one function that the Xantrex does not. And that's, this will do what, what I call load support. So let's say you're running things in your rig. You're running a induction cooktop, air conditioner, microwave, and then you start up a hairdryer. Well, that is well more than 30 amps. And you would expect in a regular RV or regular inverter to just say, no, I'm not going to do that. This one actually will, will start inverting from the batteries to support shore power if that is required. So if you're plugged into shore power, I actually could run all of those things. So this thing can transfer and pass through a total of 50 amps. That's a big deal. So that's something I'm taking into account on this side of the inverter charger. Now, the other thing that this inverter charger will do is 
So in our experience with the inverter in Lance, there were two things we did all the time. One is we turned it on and off. And number two is that we changed the input rating. So if we were plugged into a 15 amp plug in someone's driveway or a 20 amp plug, we would change that input rating all the time. Now, you can do that on the Xantrex, but to change that input, it's seriously, it's menu item 24 that you have to scroll through with a lot of beeping and then you can change it and it's not very intuitive. The control panel for this one has a little dial and some numbers and you just dial it down to 15 amps and you're done. So that is a capability I'm very much looking forward to with this inverter charger. Okay, so that's the inverter charger. It can put out 50 amps. That's why on the next step I have upgraded, look at this, that is beastly cable upgraded wiring between the inverter charger and the load center for the RV. So now this is six, six gauge wiring with two conductors and a ground and that's what will be going from here to here. So that it can handle 50 amps means that I also needed to get a load center that could handle 50 amps. And so I checked, I actually even called the, the people who made the load center that's currently in the echo and they said no just don't even try to put 50 amps through it so what i have here is a 30 slash 50 amp load center so now this will handle 50 amps and since i'm single phase i'm going to use a single single pole breaker here now a 50 amp single pole breaker is not a common item you're not going to find it at like you know your local lowe's or home depot but you can get them and so i've got one and it's a match for all the other breakers that are currently in the Echo, so that's fine. Um, I've got six spots. I'm gonna have to use the half height breakers here in order to get everything that I want in because there's, you know, there's the main, but then I've got, uh, let's see, an air conditioner, a microwave, induction cooktop, two outlets for receptacles, and then I've got one spare for potential future expansion. So gonna have to get some half height breakers, but those I can, 20 and 15 amps, I can find those at the local hardware center. So that's the load center. Now there's one trick that I may try, and this is something I picked up from the leisure travel van owners group and, and someone there who contacted me. Um, I might try, instead of using this breaker, I might try to use the other half uh, see, it's split up here on the, on the hot side. I might try to use the other half of this breaker panel and put in a 30 amp breaker there instead of there. Whether or not I do that, I'll have to split the neutral bar here, but whether or not I do that depends on how easy it's gonna be to run the wires. Whichever way is easier to run the wires given what's already there, that's how I'm gonna do it. So, remains to be seen. I may use that trick. If I do, I'll let you know when I do. And that's kind of going to do it. Now, a couple other things. All the wires are going to be, you know, appropriately protected with something like this, you know, so that, because remember, it's an RV, it's bouncing down the road, things are going to vibrate. You don't want something to vibrate and cut through the insulation. So I've got some, some of that. There's more coming. I even have, because this is like not small stuff, I even have this monster tubing for this. So that's kind of an overview of the 120 volt side of things. That's where we're going. Whether or not it winds up this way when I get it all installed remains to be seen, but that's what I've got planned. All right, so here we are now looking at the 12 volt side of things. And I know it's the 12 volt side of things because everything suddenly got much, much heavier, like physically heavier, moving it and bringing it over to this table. And that starts with the batteries. And this is just one of the batteries that will be going into number one. Um, this is a lithium X 320 amp hour battery. It provides over 4,000 watt hours of lithium power. We'll be having five, five of these batteries that will be going into number one, which will give us over 20,000 watt hours of power. Hence the name, the 20K project. That was the goal. Okay, so now these batteries are gonna be wired in parallel. And to do that inside the batteries, I'm gonna use this two watt wiring. So we got some, some red and black and they will be wired to each other, all the negative to negative, positive to positive, just like that. So that we'll have effectively one giant battery 
And when we take the power off of the battery, we will use a four odd cable, which is this stuff. Jeez, this stuff here. Maybe I can get that in. There we go. Which is this stuff here. This is super heavy stuff. And we will use this to take power off the battery. And we're going to do it on the diagonal. So like imagine the five batteries being in a line with all the negatives and positives connected together. This will come off of one end. And then at the battery at the other end of the line, will take off the positive. And that sort of forces things to equalize throughout the chain of batteries. So that's how we'll be doing that. But the power connections are not the only connections that you make to a lithionics battery. So the next one is going to be this. And this is where the positive lead is going to go from the battery, one end, and then the other end is going to go to this 250 amp circuit breaker. Now, this is a remote trip circuit breaker. And so these green wires, this is an extra lithionics battery harness I've got here. And the green wires will connect to this so that the battery can trip the circuit breaker if it senses something it doesn't like. So the question becomes is, do you need to connect all five batteries to the circuit breaker? Or could you just connect one? Or do they need to be connected in parallel? How do you connect them to the circuit breaker? Well, I've asked the folks at lithionics and here's the deal. This will protect against, well, this will protect against two things, basically. This will protect against an overcurrent situation of 250 amps. And that will do that without any remote connections at all, right? It'll protect, it'll, it'll trip if we get more than 250 amps going through the system. And since any one of these batteries is capable of handling 250 amps, as long as there's at least one battery standing, this breaker will protect everything fine. And if there's no battery standing, well then clearly you don't even need the circuit breaker. So that's one thing. Now it can protect against an over voltage situation. And the way it does that is with the remote trip, right? The battery would say, Hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. It's, it's, you know, I got like 25 volts coming at me. Stop. And then it would trip the circuit breaker. So since I'm going to be wiring the batteries in parallel, all of the batteries are going to be seeing the same voltage. And so any one of the batteries in theory could have the authority to trip the breaker. So any one of the batteries can be connected. Hence, we only need one battery connected to the remote trip circuit breaker. So that's one set of connections to these green wires, a remote trip. Now the other one, there's a battery temperature sensor, which goes to the alternator. Since all the batteries that I'm going to be using are going to be in the same compartment, and they're all going to be roughly at the same temperature. It doesn't really matter which battery gets connected to the temperature sensor for the Balmar. The batteries don't really care. The batteries are well capable of protecting themselves regardless of the, the circuit breakers or the alternator or whatever. The, the connections to the alternator at this point are more for the protection of the alternator. So any one battery connected to the temperature sensor is going to be fine. And then the last connection is this field control circuit where the battery just says yes, no. And again, the battery doesn't need that protection. That is there to protect the alternator from what they call a load dump scenario where the alternator is just producing gobs of power with no place for it to go. And again, since any one of these batteries can handle everything the alternator can put out, as long as there is a battery standing, it doesn't matter that the alternator hasn't been tripped. When the la if, so any one battery basically could be connected to the alternator to say, stop. You could daisy chain these together and then you know any of the five batteries could tell it to stop, but that's really not necessary. So in my install, I will be connecting one battery to the field control circuit and one battery to the remote trip for the circuit breaker and one battery to the temperature sensor. And I'll probably do that all on the same battery because they're all in one harness and we'll call that battery number one's number one battery, I suppose. So that's the connections from the battery. Two aught cable connecting the batteries internally to each other, four aught off the battery. Now from the battery, we're going to go to the circuit breaker. I've already mentioned that. And then from the circuit breaker, we're going to go into these, which I alluded to before. These are sexy bus bars. So they're Victron links. And the reason I like these so much is because, and this one I've taken the cover off, is because it's a positive and negative bus bar. And so the positive connections are up here, negatives made down below in one place. It's not like me trying to shoehorn two bus bars and making a bunch of short lengths of cable or anything like that. And they have these, you can connect these two together 
So this will go into a slot here on the end of this one and you can link ha, the name links. You can link them together and then you've got basically just 1000 amp bus bar. Now, the cool thing about it is that each of the places on this bus bar accepts a fuse. So I've got a mega fuse, this one is 80 amps and I'm going to install fuses. And so now not only do I have two bus bars in a small amount of space, I've also got space for eight fuses in a small amount of space. And so I don't have to worry about rigging up fuse holders or anything like that. I've got fuses and bus bars all in one location. Fan freaking tastic. So what's gonna go in here? This one, I act, this is one where I actually wrote notes and made a cheat sheet. So in one of them, just because they'll all be kind of close together, I'm gonna put the big boys. So I'm gonna have positive and negative from the alternator. I'm gonna have positive and negative from the battery. And then this inverter actually takes two connections. They want you to double up two aught cable. And so two of them will go to the inverter. And this other one, we're gonna have, what are we gonna have? We're gonna have solar. We're gonna have one that goes to the battery boost switch, which is a capability that's built into the coach that I would like to preserve. So the battery boost switch. Um, another one going to the 12 volt side of the load center. We'll get to that in just a moment. And then another one available for future expansion should I add something else that I need to. So all seven of the eight slots are going to be filled. All right. So four out wires coming in here. These two link together. From here, I guess we can talk about the alternator. I mentioned that I would have, and this is, I'm really not looking forward to this. Of all the parts that I'm not looking forward to, rerunning cable from the alternator to the bus bar is the one I'm not looking forward to the mostest because it requires me crawling around under, under the RV for probably an extended period of time with really heavy cable and 100 degree heat. So why am I doing that? The cables in the Echo that run from the alternator to the 12 volt side of things are three aught cables and that's enough to handle any kind of output that that alternator can provide. But Remember, I'm moving the batteries and I'm moving the load center. And while I can certainly make the cable shorter, I can't really make it longer. And that's what I would need in order to get things up to the batteries and to the load, to the, we'll call this a load center, to the 12 volt heavy duty bus bar. So I got to run new cable anyway, because I got to make it longer. Eh, kind of a bummer. Um, the other thing is since I'm going to be running new cable, why not run some bigger cable so that if there is an alternator upgrade at some point in the future, I am sized to handle it. Now, 170 amp alternator, that's great, but I'm quintupling the amount of battery capacity. So it is going to take correspondingly five times as long for it to charge should I run those batteries all the way down. Realistically, on a day to day basis, if I'm using the same amount of power as someone else, it's not going to take me any longer to recharge than it will them. But if I got the batteries all the way depleted, it would take a long time to charge them up. So thinking ahead for any possible alternator upgrade, hence the 4 i cable. And that's why I have so much of this stuff um, because all this is going to be very close together, but I need the length to get all the way up to the engine. So, okay, one more thing on these bus bars and then I'll move on. I was able to find some green 4 aught cable. So any place where I've got an equipment chassis ground, like I'm sure there's a ground lug somewhere on this inverter and I know there's one on the solar charge control. Any place I've got one of those, I'm going to wire that into the bus bar as well. And then from here, Winnebago has installed a basically a chassis grounding plate and I'm going to run 4 aught green so I don't get confused. Not that I would anyway, but just it's good to be all matchy and color coordinated. Um, run four out wiring all the way underneath to the chassis grounding plate where all the grounds are going to come together. Great. Okay. The alternator, this just in case, because remember I'm moving things. And so just in case I need a new wiring harness to get the connections from the alternator, like all the way up into where I'm putting the batteries now, because it's going to be different. I have another Balmar alternator harness which I could use if I needed to. I really hope I don't have to do that too because then I got to get into the top of the engine and let's hope I don't need to use this, but I have it if I need it. There we go. Okay. Now the inverter comes next because it's an inverter charger. The connections called for on the inverter charger recall call for two watt cable and two sets of them. So there's going to be two, two watts coming out of there into here and the same with the red and the black. So there we go. 
that handles the 12 volt side of the inverter charger. And this thing can charge it, I, th I think it's 120 amps. Yeah, it's right here on the front. 120 amps of battery charging capacity. And I'm gonna dial that up just as high as it can go. So there's that. Now, from here I mentioned that we we're gonna go to the load center. So the new load center that I'm gonna be putting in, there's a 12 volt side and 120 volt side. Might as well just show you. This side is the 12 volt side. 120 volt over here, 12 volt on this side of the partition. So I'll be replacing all this because I have to, because of the 50 amp thing. But as far as running wire, I am going to use the existing, I'm not increasing the capacity on the 12 volt side here. So I'm going to reuse the existing wiring that is there that gets from the batteries to the 12 volt side of the DC load center. I'm not increasing things, so it should be fine. And I've actually checked and already found where that wire is. It's a nice thick six or eight gauge wire. Should be able to handle anything that's coming on there. And like I said, I'm not increasing the capacity, so we should be fine there. Okay, um, a bunch of miscellaneous parts like, you know, cable lugs and stuff. So you'll see me crimping cables. These are the four aught ones. So I get to practice a lot. That's another reason I got so much cable is because I figure I'm gonna screw it up a few times. Um, practice making crimped connections. Maybe I'll even cut one of my crimps apart, see how well I do. <sighs> okay, so that's the 12 volt side. Now I get to put all this stuff back and it's heavy. All right, coming back next with solar. Okay, so let's talk solar. Now, I gotta explain myself a little bit here because normally in a rig with lots and lots of watt hours of lithium capacity, I'd be kind of meh about solar and I would think it wouldn't matter. However, when we went test camping in our Echo, we noticed that just 455 watts of solar, apart from air conditioning, that 455 watts of solar was able to keep our batteries pretty much topped up more or less all the time for everything but air conditioning. And so then I thought, well, can we go further with that? And so this is, I'm kind of doing this just because I want to play around with it and see how far I can take it. So I am planning in the future to more or less double the solar capacity of number one. So it's got 455, I'm shooting for 680, which is four of these 170 watt panels. And they all fit, or they should, <laughs> famous last words. They should all fit on the roof without issue. We'll see when we get there. This doesn't have to happen as part of the 20K project. But since I'm gonna have everything opened up, probably the best time, there will never be a better time to work on any solar upgrades from a infrastructure perspective. Okay, so let's start. So the panels are on the roof. I'm gonna leave that the same. And then they're in a three port combiner box on the roof and they're all wired up in parallel there. All the panels on the roof I've looked, they're all fused each at 15 amps. And then the wires run down inside and there is a 40 amp fuse there. So that's all fine. But then what I'm gonna do is I'm going to remove the Xantrex solar charge controller. Now in the back of the Xantrex solar charge controller, much like this one, there are more or less basically four connections. There are two for positive and negative coming in from the solar panels, and there are two going out for positive and negative to the battery. So what I'm going to do basically is remove that solar charge controller and wire those two sets together so that the wires will run all the way down underneath, underneath to the compartment where I'm planning on putting my new solar charge controller. In place of the, to make that connection, I'm not just gonna splice them together. What I'm gonna do is I've got a switch. And this is a switch like that. It's, you know, when you're flipping the switch, it's kind of hard to do. I'm gonna add this switch to disconnect the solar panels from the roof, from getting into the coach. I cannot tell you how many times in Lance I did an electrical project and be able to dzz, dzz, because the solar panels are always live whenever you're in the sun, right? You can't switch off the solar panels themselves. And if they're wired directly into everything, there's always gonna be some power presence. So with this, I can shut off the solar panels and work in peace without being zapped or having to climb up on the roof and actually unplug them, which I should have done more often, but didn't. Um, anyway, so wiring in this switch. So then now the wire is going from the, Zan uh, not the Xantrax solar charge controller to the battery compartment, those are eight gauge wires. That's gonna be plenty enough to handle. I mean, they're designed to handle 30 amps from the Winnebago panels. So 
that's what we're going to do. That's going to run down to the compartment where all this stuff is going to go. And then we have this, my new solar charge controller. Yes, this is an MPPT controller in place of the PWM controller that, uh, that ships with. Now, I'm often kind of lukewarm on the benefits of MPPT, but to get a PWM solar charge controller that could handle all of the amperage I'm planning on throwing at it, I was getting to something about this big anyway, and the MPPT will allow me to run different voltages and do the whole series parallel accommodation and test. To work that out, I've got a bunch of connections, basically. We're still using XAMPP panels. XAMPP panels, as you know, use this SAE type of connection. Everything else in the solar industry uses these MC4 connectors. And so I have converters to get from SAE to MC4 and then back again in the correct, in the correct polarity for XAMPP wiring. So what that will allow me to do when it gets time to run the panels, it'll allow me to do things like, okay, let's hook up all four of these panels in series. Click, 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 click and then all four of them are in series. We'll see what we get. Let's do two in series and two strings of two panels. So a series parallel, boom, we can do it. We can, well, I could only do three in parallel, but you get the idea. I'll be able to do experiments like that, same day, same conditions, whatever. So they'll be pretty meaningful. So that's coming. Okay, now I'm also planning, so Winnebago does not install in the Echo uh, a port for you to hook up an external solar panel. Um, and the reason they don't do this, a very good reason, is because they've got just about as much solar on the roof of it already as you can possibly run through that solar charge controller. So they don't really want you hooking up any more panels. I get it. Um, however, new solar charge controller. And we have solar, you may have seen an old video where I put solar on the roof of our RV carport. And so by adding a, panel, a port for external panels, I'll be able to plug that in and then just kind of keep the RV on, uh, on, you know, sort of a maintenance charge of solar while we're not using it. So Zamp makes a port with a bracket on it that's like that. But I think what I'm going to do, actually, is just take the port out of it and wire it directly into the rear bumper. Um, the rear bumper is hollow and there's already some wires running in there from the blind spot monitoring that Winnebago has installed. So I think I'm just going to tack that right into the bumper and then I'll just plug the solar panels into the back bumper when we are at home under the carport. So that's that. And then all of this will be connected. So from here and from here, we'll all come together here on the panel side of the solar charge controller. Now from the battery side, we're not gonna connect it to the battery. We're gonna go with this, what is this? Four gauge I got, I think. Four gauge wire, is it four? Yeah, four gauge wire. I'm gonna go from the solar charge controller to the sexy bus bar. So instead of connecting directly to the battery, that will give me the opportunity to put a fuse in here, another 80 amp fuse. So there'll be a 40 amp fuse from the panels to the solar charge controller and an 80 amp fuse. And this can only put out 70 amps anyway, from the solar charge controller into the bus bar system. So that's what we've got planned coming up here. Like I said, a lot of this doesn't have to be done now, like this whole bit with the series parallel. That's a whole separate video investigation unto itself. But since I'm going to be wiring all this stuff up, good a time as any to swap out the solar charge controller. So there you go. And this brings us finally around to the mechanical and, and you know, HVAC, the, the hardware side of things. And I'm not going to kid you, I'm not looking forward to this part because it is going to be hard physical work. Um, but it's got to be done, so let's, uh, let's just go ahead and dive into it. So first, um, the batteries are going inside, so they're not going to be in the same place where Winnebago has them, which means I need to come up with some way to securely hold them down. Now, I've seen people that have just put like, you know, cargo straps or, you know, one of those <laughs> ratchet strap kind of things to hold down their batteries. And then that's, but that's only as good as like the strap that holds, you know, what you're holding the strap in place with. So. Here's what I have come up with. I'm going to use this uh, square steel tubing, which has holes at regular intervals throughout it. I'm going to put one piece. So, so imagine there are two batteries here because a lot of it's going to be two batteries. Put one piece on top of the batteries and then drop some all thread down through it and put another piece under the floor. 
and then I've got appropriate nuts and washers and whatnot to cinch it up and hold it. But then I got to thinking, well, actually this is steel and the battery case is aluminum and knowing myself like I do, I tend to over tighten bolts and nuts and things like that. And so I thought, well, gosh, am I gonna dent the case of the battery? Do I really want the steel pressing on the aluminum like that? So I made some of these. Now, you remember that diagram I erased um, at the very start of this video? That was actually these. So what these are, these are little battery corner clips. So I will put them, eh, I'll put them on the battery like so, and then this bar rests in the channel like that, and then I can tighten it down and the bar will be held off the battery ever so slightly. I think it's three millimeters. Um, and when I, I, I 3D printed them, and when I printed them, I made them only sort of half solid. So if I do my typical James thing and just go and start cranking down on the nuts, this is gonna crack before it's gonna dent the case. And then I'll know, dude, back off. So that's what I'm gonna do for the batteries to hold them in place, right? So there's gonna be one, two, I got a total of six clips. So it'll be two pairs of batteries and then a single battery. And they're all gonna be kind of held in place the same way. Now I have checked ahead of time and it is gonna be possible for me to get through the floor and to be able to access that under floor location where, uh, where I'm gonna put the batteries. That's key, otherwise this, this wouldn't work. So that's part of it. But then the next part gave me a little pause. Um, I'm going to have to remove those seats, the, the kind of bucket seats, whatever, the three with the three point belts. There's a substantial amount of steel holding those in and basically so much steel that nothing can go, they're super safe. If you're gonna use them to put kids in, they're gonna be safer than you are up front. Um, but there's a lot of steel there and I couldn't fit anything else in that space with that there. So those are coming out. So they are bolted through the floor and they're bolted into nuts. And some of those nuts, they're actually over the top of the gas tank. And so I was like really worried and I've checked and I even asked Winnebago and yes. So the nuts are kind of welded onto the steel frame. So basically those bolts, there are six of them holding on the you know, six like grade bazillion bolts holding those seats down. And so I should be able to remove those bolts, take the seats out and then put the bolts back in to fill in the holes. And hopefully that works. We'll have to see, you know, if the bolts, if I can, get the bolts flush with the floor, maybe cut out some of the flooring so the bolts sit flush so they're not bolt heads poking up and making my batteries rock. But that's the plan. Hopefully I don't have to drop the gas tank to retrieve a lost nut or something. And I'm, I'm a little bit worried about that, but they're welded in there so they should be okay. Um, when I remove the seat though, I am going to put in, I bought a seat belt, like a, a 90 inch long seat belt because I do sometimes work from what will become a bench seat location while we are driving. And I would like some way to at least remain mostly in that spot in the event of an accident. So I'm gonna use two of the six holes to mount this seat belt, which will then be able to secure people to the passengers or the, the bench seat, what will be the bench seat. Now, the next thing I'm gonna talk about, there's a little bit where I gotta go outside and show you what I mean. So let's step outside for the next bit. This is the battery compartment as it exists today in number one. But this is where I am going to put the inverter. The battery won't be here, but the inverter is going to be in here. Now the inverter is a, an appliance that produces heat. And so, whereas normally people might be concerned about, you know, the battery is getting too cold, I have kind of the opposite concern. I am concerned that putting the inverter in this space, it may get too hot. And so I've been thinking about what I need to do to accommodate for that. And I have what I think will be a pretty good solution. And I'll show you that inside because I'm already too hot and I've been out here for like 90 seconds and it's killing me. So the inverter will go in here and then I've got a heat management solution. Let's go inside quickly and we'll see that. <laughs> so you know what's really funny actually is that I couldn't sit out there for three minutes and talk, but I'm somehow expecting that I'm going to be able to work and pull wire and crawl around underneath the rig out there. That's, I'm going to be doing this all at like 5 a.m. and 10 p.m. is what it's going to turn out as. Anyway, um, this is my solution to the, uh, the inverter potential heat problem. So this is a fan. It's a 120 volt fan, so it will only operate 
when the inverter is operating, but that's okay because the inverter only needs to do anything when there's 120 volt power. It's either creating it or using it to charge the battery. In either case, this will be active. This is a thermostatically controlled fan. Here's the thermostat. I'll just mount this in there with the inverter and anytime the temperature is over, you know, I don't know what, 90, 100 degrees, whatever, I will have this thing kick on. This can move 240 cubic feet per minute of air. That compartment's about eight cubic feet. So 30 times per minute, the air in that compartment is gonna be changed out. So now I've got some of this, which is duct work. And this is the same, you know, like dryer vent stuff. It's the same size. And I can probably use some of the same fittings that you would use for a dryer connection in your home. I just need to be careful that where I mount this to get the exterior air from the, uh, from, from the van, that I am not somehow, you know, gonna let water into the, into the rig. Anyway, so the inverter has a particular way. It's meant to be, you know, best possible mounting solution for that inverter would be to hang it vertically on a wall, right? It's meant for the heat to flow from the connection end up through the top and out the top. Obviously, I'm not gonna be doing that. It's gonna be laying on its back in a compartment. So I'm going to want to make sure the cool air comes in where the inverter is pulling air from or potentially the coach or the, you know, the coach part of the RV where it would be even colder. And then I'm gonna to wanna to make sure that it takes the exhaust air from the top end and then throws it outside somewhere. So that's the plan for this. I, I think 240 cubic feet a minute ought to be okay. We'll see. Um, this is actually like people use these in grow houses. Dude, I took the fan out of my grow house and I put it in the RV. Dick. Anyway, all right, so that's the AC. Now, the other stuff, I've got the sexy Italian table up here because there will be some other more or less woodworking kind of stuff that's required, right? That's gonna be building a bench seat in that area, uh, L-shaped bench seat in that area that covers up the batteries and provides some seating. Um, it's also going to include mounting this table and making a table top for it. And this is the table that slides in all different directions. Now, I am, I, I selected a pedestal table deliberately because A, I just don't like lagoon tables. Don't tell anyone. Well, I just told like a billion people. Uh, I don't like lagoon tables. <laughs> I'll just come out and say it. Um, because they bounce and I don't like a table that bounces. And a lagoon is a cantilever. A cantilever is always gonna bounce no matter what you do. So, got a pedestal table. The other benefit of a pedestal table is that I can wrap it with a rope and now I've got a scratching post for Mel that I don't have to have take up any extra space in the RV. It's space that was already out of commission anyway with the pedestal table leg. So there will be bench shaped seat and then a pedestal table leg and a pedestal and what else? Cushions. I'm not gonna make the cushions myself. We're gonna find someone. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put Steph in charge of that actually is finding someone to make cushions with fabric coverings or whatever that complements the decor, yada, 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 that'll be fine. The other thing I gotta make out of wood actually is gonna be a mounting board where I can mount all that 12 volt stuff, the link bars and whatever. That's all gonna be mounted to a board attached in the RV. And so that is the mechanical, the HVAC, and then the battery hold downs and the furniture. And that should be the end of what this job requires. And I'm out of coffee, which makes this a good time to end the video. Um, okay, so that's it. That's an overview of the 20K project and all the different areas I think I've, I've gotten myself into. Um, I'm thinking it's probably gonna take most of a month because I, I literally am coming to the conclusion that I'm going to have to work just early, early in the morning and late, late at night in order to get this done because it's just too hot. I'm gonna to have to disconnect the power, right? So it's not like I'm gonna have air conditioning or even light. So that'll be an interesting challenge. Um, that's what I'm gonna be doing. And there's gonna be multiple videos about it. And it starts off with the very first thing, which is tearing things out. So there's a lot of stuff I gotta remove, um, some mechanical things like that, uh, the transfer switch, the bucket seats, those are coming out. A lot of the electrical stuff underneath I won't be using, so that can come out. Um, the battery's gotta come out, et cetera. So when I remove stuff, I am going to take the extra step of labeling things that I think I might need 
to reuse. So like, you know, the wire that runs to the chassis battery for the battery boost switch. Let me label on that one and keeping it around because I'm gonna need that. Um, so then there's some other wires that I'll have to label as well. So I've got, I've got my label maker and I've got some clear shrink wrap. So I'll be doing the super anal retentive labeling thing on some of the wires. Um, <laughs> But that's all part of the tear out and that's what's next and it's seriously like the hottest part of the day here. So I don't think I'm going to start that right now, but I will be starting it tomorrow morning. Um, yeah, so that's it. Stay tuned. It's going to be, it'll be a thing and I'm pretty sure it'll be a project. I'll bleed at some point. So you can make bets on how far in it's going to be before I bleed. Anyway, it's James from the Fit RV. We'll see you later. Bye.